Do you have that loaded up just in case? You're on I mute. Yeah. I was just going to text her to have it open. Yeah, good. Yeah, everybody should have backups ready to go just in case, okay? And so, so Chris, or I guess Sukena, the residents, they're going to stay on the same link here for their session with, with Linda? Okay. So, so basically, it's one link. There's no switching of links. You're on mute. Sorry. I don't know about the, the one hour after with the residents. Okay. I don't know about that, yeah. I, I want to make sure we're, we're kind of, we don't have to bounce around. It sounds like we're going to stay on this link. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone can stay on this link. <clears throat> I'll pass it. I'll pass host off to one of the residents. Good. on the same link is we'll need to kick off anybody who doesn't get off um who isn't a resident or dr leo yeah that's doable is jb on the call yet no can i have them in the background and then Costa, just I'm gonna need about 30 seconds to a minute to turn over the YouTube live stream after okay. the first session before the intro. Okay. But we're again, we're all just staying on. We're not we're all staying on. Yeah. That's just the YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the other question is, is Logan show on? Yes, hi, I'm here. Hey, Logan, great. We're gonna get started here momentarily. We're waiting for Dr. Betterson to join us. Good morning. 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 Uh, I'm going to share my screen. If you don't mind. 
Vale. Uh, I, I'm just reordering things a little bit. Uh, there's a little bit of institutional memory that I would like to try to uh, impart. Uh, we're going to try to get started uh, fairly briskly. It's a busy, busy day, very exciting day. Uh, as many of you know, and maybe some of you don't know, uh, every year we have a series of invited lectures, visiting professors, uh, as well as to recognize some of the research that goes on in the department. Research is one of the cornerstones of this department and any academic neurosurgery department. There's not a single neurosurgery attending or resident who doesn't do research or uh, love research or uh, participate in research. And it's the really one of the foundations of the entire department and the, and the field of neurosurgery, frankly. Um, Research, uh, along with education, uh, supports our clinical efforts. And I do want to just mention that uh, this is the 75th year of the neurosurgery residency, making it one of the longest standing residencies in the country. Uh, Research Day was started by Dr. Romano, uh, and this would mark the 25th annual Department of Neurosurgery Research Day. Um, you can see that I have 24 here because I was scrambling to get slides from last year uh, when I realized we didn't have these. So I uh, forgive that. But uh, at that time, uh, 25 years ago, uh, Isabel proposed that we would have a basic science research day as some of us were involved in basic science research at that time. Um, on that day in 1996, uh, Several of us presented, um, and uh, I actually was just going back. I don't have the time now in this introduction, but maybe next year I will show you some of the slides from that, uh, that time in 1996, what we were doing, uh, what we were thinking at that time, and what our research efforts were. I, you might be surprised at the depth and level of research that was going on even back then. Um, then sometime after, in 2002, the Wade Satchdev Memorial Lecture was added to the program. Um, and following that, uh, research presentation awards, the post lecture, and the post award. And so today you're going to see a magnificent effort uh, of, of research uh, that was organized by Costas and uh, Sukena. Um, and we're going to start with posters. Uh, you, uh, those of you who are presenting, uh, I want you to be brisk. I don't want you to be nervous, but I want you to be brisk. And so we're going to try to hold people to, to this. And so here you see our presenters, our poster presenters. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Costas and Chris. Well, we're going to get started here. We, uh, we have a lot to get through. And as Dr. Betterson uh, just announced to us, it's an exciting day. And we're really looking forward to hearing all our presenters today. We are going to allot uh, basically two minutes for the presentation, which is a poster presentation of one slide with one question, a uh, one minute for question. So Dr. Kellner is going to help moderate this portion of the program. I think uh, Logan uh, is our first speaker. First up, we have Logan Cho, first year medical student. Thanks, yeah, so I'll just jump right in. Um, acute kidney injury, or AKI, has been reported to occur in cases of severe traumatic brain injury, though the rate at which it occurs uh, varies throughout the literature. Therefore, the goals of this study were one, to report the AKI incidence in isolated severe TBI cases, and two, to explore predictive factors of AKI in TBI. And to this end, we utilize the American College of Surgeons Trauma Quality Improvement Program um, to perform a retrospective cohort analysis of over 340,000 patients. And this database is nationally sourced and comes from over 850 American trauma centers. We performed a multivariable logistic regression analysis with multiple imputation, as well as a sensitivity analysis using listwise deletion, and results from the multivariable were preserved in the sensitivity analysis. And of note, this is the largest, most generalizable analysis of AKI and TBI based off of um, prior literature. And the strength primarily exists in the large study sample size, as well as the nationally sourced nature of the database. And so we found that AKI develops in 0.5% or one in 200 cases of isolated severe TBI, 
Um, and in the past literature, the incidence um, had a reported range of 0.5% to 8%. And so that's a fairly large range. And this study certainly exists on the lower end, but the lower end of the um, previously reported ranges. Below that figure, I've included a forest plot, and I really just want to draw your attention to the bottom odds ratio here. Um, that's for acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And we found ARDS to have an extremely high magnitude of an odds ratio associated with AKI, and that was over nine. And even among many variables that we found to be associated with AKI, uh, the ARDS you know, stood out among all of them. And so in this study population, ARDS was extremely associated with AKI presence. The table in the top right shows, another, um, shows a number of other major factors that we found to be associated with AKI. And this is primarily here for your reference, but I can just highlight a few of them, older age, male sex, self-reported black race, as well as a number of comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes. And so to just quickly wrap up, uh, this study was able to uh, report an AKI incidence of 0.5% in cases of isolated severe traumatic brain injury, as well as a number of factors associated with AKI um, presence um, in TBI cases. And the hope is, is that this study can just help inform clinicians uh, who treat patients with severe TBI of the nature of concomitant acute kidney injury. And so with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Logan. We have 30 seconds for questions. Feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, uh, or if you're a panelist, you can just ask your question. Thanks very much, Logan. We're going to move on to Jacques Larrarena, a pre residency fellow. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to, to present this project. I'm going to talk about availability and reliability of spinal cord injury online information materials for Spanish speaking population in neurosurgical academic programs. So we look for uh, all these uh, residency programs through the ACGME database. Um, we look for specific websites link to these programs and, or to the hospital, uh, affiliated hospitals to these institutions. We look for spinal cord injury patient focus material um, in order to like educated material uh, in, in the original English uh, language. Then we assess two factors, availability of this uh, same information in Spanish and the reliability using the, the indice flash uh, secrets, which is a validated um, uh, table to in translation from Spanish, to, from English to Spanish and assess the, the complexity of the material. This in here, you can see the, the score. The, the results that we found uh, from the a total of 116 accredited programs uh, last year, we only found 111 websites in original English language. From this, 26.1% uh, had um, an available written material in Spanish. Um, it's, it's important to notice that we only focus on written material in Spanish, not like uh, um, a video or kind of a, a multimedia um, uh, 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 information. Uh, we, it took an average of 72 seconds and five clicks to find information from the original English to, into the Spanish um, translation, or also um, the information about the services that every institution provides regarding the interpreter or translation service. Uh, the mean influx score that we found in all this 26% uh, of material, it was 51.8 which is translated as a somewhat difficult to understand to the lay person. As you can see in the table, 71% uh, of the, the, the websites has only this information about the translation and interpreter service, which is not directly related to spinal cord injury information that we were looking. Uh, the most optimal translation um, information, reading information was the mirror information. You, and we only found 9%. So the conclusion is the majority of academic neurosurgical programs across the US do not provide access to written online patient education material for a Spanish speaking population regarding spinal cord injury. When this is available, the information is not always transmitted with a proper level of readability for the lay person. And the majority of websites provide contact information about interpreter or translation service that are not related to spinal cord injury. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jacques. We have time for one question.
Jacques, do you think automated translation services um, can make an impact here? That's one, one parameter that we look. Uh, some websites provide this, the number three, translation application software, which is most commonly related with the, Google, the platform of Google, Google Translator. They sometimes put a link in which not only Spanish, but other language, they can do an automated translation. But the accuracy of the translation is it's, it's variable. It's not uh, completely accurate. Okay, thanks very much, Jacques. Thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna move on to Diksha Shada, an analyst working with Dr. Dangayach. Hi, um, so today I'm presenting on the effects of the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic on the NEMAT program within the Mount Sinai Health System. As many of you know, the Neuro Neuroemergencies Management and Transfers Program, also known as NEMAT, is a centralized interfacility transfer program within the health system designed to ensure that critically ill patients are receiving the right care at the right time. When New York City became the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis, we adapted NEMAT to accommodate both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 neuroemergencies. Because NEMAT is an important component of patient care and safety within the department, we wanted to determine how the program was affected during the first wave of the COVID-19 outbreak. We compared neuroemergency transfer volumes and metrics within the health system between a pre-COVID period and a COVID period. The pre-COVID period was defined to be from January 1st to March 14th, and the COVID period was from March 15th to May 31st. We included data from 2018 through 2020 to account for any changes between the periods that weren't caused by COVID. Thus, the pre-COVID versus COVID period variable was operationalized as a level one predictor and the year variable was operationalized as a level two predictor. First, we assessed the need for a multi-level mixed model for each outcome of interest, uh, disease type and transfer times. We first assessed if there was any clustering effects due to year. And if there, were, if there weren't any, then we conducted a general regression analysis. We found that there was no clustering due to year for both outcomes and it conducted a reject, just regular regression analyses without accounting for clustering. Both disease type and transfer times were not significantly different between the two periods uh, after adjusting for accepting hospital type, type and race. So the NEMAT program is a robust systems of care approach for managing your emergencies. NEMAT maintained transfer quality and access to care for patients during the first wave of the pandemic. Thanks very much, Disha. Any questions from anybody? Did you think about it or sort of postulate as to why when other parts of the healthcare system were at least somewhat overwhelmed, why it shouldn't be overwhelmed? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Peter, you lost your last volume there. Peter. Hmm. We're, we're losing audio on you. You might have to type your question. Um, did you, I do have a question while he's working out audio. Did, did you separate different waves? Because it would be interesting to see what the first wave did to transfer. And if, if NEMAT was interrupted with the second wave, which seemed to be managed uh, more efficiently. That's going to be our first or next step. Um, once we publish this, we will be looking at the second wave and how it affected it as well. Okay, thanks very much. It's time to move on. Uh, so Peter, you can type your question in. Um, next up is Rebecca Barron, uh, medical student at Mount Sinai. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to present our team's work. I'll be presenting on the learning curve for minimally invasive transferaminal lumbar interbody fusions or mist lif a systematic review. So as many of you know, mist lif is indicated for a variety of conditions, including spinal stenosis and spinal stasis. Cited benefits include reduced muscle damage, decreased infections, decreased blood loss, shorter length of stay, and decreased cost. But a major criticism is that there's a very steep learning curve to develop proficiency in this procedure. So the objective that we had was to conduct a systematic review that evaluates the reporting of the learning curve for mist lift and also to compare the perioperative factors and clinical outcomes during and after the, um, the completion of this learning curve. The methods that we employed included a literature search of PubMed and Embase, including full-length manuscripts, um, everything that was published in English, and anything that had statistical um, factors that we can evaluate. And we had two independent reviewers assess the abstracts and full-length manuscripts, and then we went on to do monotonic trends of the operative durations and during and after the learning curve, and use man-candled non-parametric tests. So the result of our study um, found 13 studies that actually met our inclusion criteria and found that the learning curve was established around 14 to 44 cases. We also saw negative 
trends for early and late um, in the learning curve for operative durations, showing both efficiency and proficiency of the surgeons. We also saw vast pain scores that were showed positive results even early on and initial uh, fusion rates for the, based on the Bridwell grade one criteria ranged from 52 to 95%. So in conclusion, the learning curve that we saw in the systematic review was around 14 to 44 cases. Operative times decreased as can be seen in the figure and initial complication rates did vary a bunch um, among surgeons, but we can cite that to both mentorship and use of technology. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. A special thanks to Will Schumann, our first author. Hey, Rebecca. Thanks very much. We have a few minutes for questions or comment. Nice job, Rebecca. Uh, quick question. In your review of the literature, there's such a growing body on robotic spine surgery now. Did you find anything on how that can help with the learning curve for MIST lifts? Um, that was not our primary outcome. I think it would be definitely worth evaluating. I think that we were like more looking at the surgeon's proficiency in, in doing these procedures, but as we all know, the field of neurosurgery is changing day by day. So future research, I guess. Yeah. I, I think we, you know, we were looking at the learning curves of, of surgeons, but, but uh, Rebecca's right in that, that like, we did find a trends in every category that surgeons were getting better with time. It was almost not the, not the purpose of our study, but you saw that the blood loss went down, the OR time went down, the, the outcomes got better. So it, it's like, we're, I think we're also demonstrating that with time, surgeons are getting better at the MIST lift procedure. Thank you, Dr. Seinberger. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Next up is Alex Schuper. Good morning. Thank you. Um, for our single arm uh, case series, we examined 31 consecutive patients who underwent surgical resection for cerebral metastasis using the synaptive exoscope over a, over a five year period between 2016 and 2020. Our primary outcomes were looking at overall as well as progression free survival. As you can see in the very small chart there in the center, uh, the most common uh, primary tumor was lung cancer followed by breast, which corresponds to established literature. We found that the majority of our patients, over 64%, uh, experienced complete resection of their metastatic lesion. We had a six-month progression-free survival of 71%, as well as an overall PFS of 58%, with an overall <clears throat> uh, survival at 12 months of 84%. And these numbers correspond with the established literature for resection of cerebral metastasis. So in this single arm uh, retrospective series, we found that uh, resection with the surgical exoscope offers several advantages in visualization as well as surgeon economics, or sorry, ergonomics uh, for resection of cerebral metastatic lesions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex. Got a few minutes for questions. And if an attendee wants to speak, if you raise your hand, I can uh, activate the speaking feature if you want to ask a question. Okay, thanks very much, Alex. We're going to move on to Ernest, our chief resident. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, also presenting on uh, resilience in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, how to bend and not break. Uh, this is a global um, and uh, international uh, community service project that the um, uh, task force uh, for uh, resilience in the face of the uh, pandemic from the World Federation of uh, Neurosurgical Societies uh, Young Neurosurgeons Forum um, was asked to put together um, a team that was originally focused on uh, global neurosurgeon wellness and then had its uh, mission redirected um, in March of last year. Uh, so given the way in which the pandemic has burdened neurosurgeons and trainees with uh, a necessary expansion of their scope of practice, um, we were invited to perform a literature review and develop uh, evidence-based recommendations uh, for uh, neurosurgeons in terms of dealing with the pandemic and emerging from it. So resilience here is variably defined as a multidimensional construct um, that um, uh, enables one to adapt well to trauma, stress, or tragedy, uh, and or to prevent the development of uh, psychiatric disease. Um, in terms of the results uh, of our research, actually much of the cutting edge research comes out of several uh, labs and investigators here at Sinai, Dr. Rousteau's lab, um, who uh, studies the neuropsychiatry um, of uh, anxiety and depression disorders, uh, demonstrated the role of neuropeptide Y, uh, serotonin, 
uh, and um, the uh, HPA access uh, and its interaction with the environment and developing um, uh, resilience, pro-resilience factors. Um, and then Dr. Charney is one of the, the world's leaders um, in this area. And so um, in our paper, which we published in February of this year, you'll find several tables um, outlining some of these recommendations, which uh, many of us initially felt were quote unquote common sense, but realized that in the face of a, of a crisis, sometimes common sense isn't as common. Um, and so you can see those recommendations here. And uh, you know, we concluded that left unaddressed, um, there is uh, an increasing risk of uh, psychiatric disease from poor ability to adapt to, uh, to uh, the kind of stress we dealt with in the course of the pandemic. Um, and uh, hopefully this will be helpful to our community. I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll do a few minutes for questions. Can I make a comment? The uh, many of you don't realize that, in addition to being a neurosurgery resident, Ernest has become himself a global leader in global neurosurgery health. Uh, we'll, I'll mention a little bit more of this when it's time for your graduation, Ernest. But you've developed an entire career that's kind of almost outside the department and brings great recognition and appreciation. So well, kudos to you on that. Thank you. Ernest, this is fantastic uh, work uh, that you led. Um, I was involved in uh, some of it, but I wanna be sure that the audience know that this is all you're doing, uh, that your leadership skills internationally and um, nationally have been growing and has been a pleasure to see that. And that this uh, paper is uh, there to stay and it is already inspiring a lot of neurosurgeons, young and not that young around the world. Thank you for your great work. Thanks, Dr. Jabana. Ernest, one quick question. Uh, great work. Did the socioeconomic conditions of the countries affect the rates of psychiatric development? That's a great question. And um, you know, anecdotally, um, so one of our uh, task force members from, from, was from South Africa, and we did find that um, in our uh, conversations, absolutely, um, there seemed to be a preponderance of, um, of uh, challenges to adapt to the crisis um, in the face of, uh, of uh, the existing challenges of resource limited settings. Thanks very much, Ernest. Next up, we've got Ray Fang. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, also, in, on the topic of COVID, another aspect of our department and our residency that has really been affected by COVID this year is the resident selection process. So um, I thought it would be very uh, important for us to understand exactly what the impact of these changes had our, on our selection process and on, the, um, on our results. So a few major uh, things that has changed is that away rotations has been canceled. Um, interviews were conducted online instead of uh, in person. And then uh, this year, we also included standardized scenario questions um, for the interviewees. So um, the numbers are small, but uh, most of the faculty who were involved in the interview process, we're able to uh, fill out our surveys. And um, the, uh, the surveys included a range of questions that in, uh, included what, uh, what qualities we looked for in selecting for our residents and what impact the faculty thought the cha um, change of interview format and um, other changes had on this year's selection process. So just to highlight a couple of results, um, the, the cancellation of in-person interviews seemed to have less of a negative impact um, than expected, uh, as in the faculties who has uh, have done the online interviews did not uh, think it significantly negatively impacted um, their their uh, selection decision, and also uh, the faculty who participated in scenario questions, most the majority thought it was um, it was appropriate and would like it, uh, these scenario questions to be included for future in person as well as online interviews. And um, and another uh, another important result to highlight is that we, um, for for most of the faculty recommendation letters and the interview impressions um, were were the top uh, the top most important factors in their consideration. So is um, it highlights 
the need for us to optimize our interview process. So the conclusion um, uh, from, from our study is that uh, conducting the interviews online and has had less of a negative impact than I expected. And we should consider, uh, continue to consider including standardized scenario questions or other methods of standardization into our future uh, selection process. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. You know, as someone who's asking those questions, I, I found them to be extremely helpful uh, to kind of differentiate how different applicants would, would answer questions and and, and differentiate them in a standardized way. If I can just make one comment, um, not really a question, Ray, but a comment is that, you know, I think what was remarkable to, to all of us was the level of engagement that you can get from a format um, such as we had developed and not, you know, not just us, but obviously everyone, every program. And I think despite the limitations, it really is a credit, I think, to um, commitment and involvement to make sure that this type of process has the real engagement and uh, degree of attention that it deserves. So um, it's, it, in my opinion, it was remarkable, actually. I had a lot of apprehension. It was remarkable how well it, 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 it matches. Hey, Ray, nice Absolutely. job. No, go ahead. Sorry, there, there is also emerging evidence um, that uh, this format is actually very positive for women and minorities. So stay tuned on that research as well. Ray, one question I had for you, it'd be nice to go back to, to the applicants themselves and kind of get their thoughts on the process. Did you do, I think you did that, right? Did you, did you uh, send a survey afterwards? No, I did not send a survey to the applicants, but that's a great idea, Dr. Hachmanis. I'd love to hear their, you know, their perspective, you know, Ray and Raj, to, to see what they thought about it. Yeah, we did send a survey and we can present that. Um, Ray was not involved with that, so she's... Uh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I knew there was a survey post uh, interview. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ray. Um, Abi, you're up. All right. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my uh, my research is regarding uh, studying exosomes in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so um, this this uh, uh, we perf I perform a scoping review of uh, of the use of ex uh, therapeutic and diagnostic um, uh, purposes uh, of exosomes uh, on patients and uh, uh, models with subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, in, especially uh, in vivo models. So a little bit of background, obviously, uh, so we're familiar with is one of the most important cause of morbidity and mortality in subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, uh, especially in the patients with secure aneurysm, it is the most com important and common cause of um, morbidity. Uh, and uh, the mechanism of cerebral venous spasm is thought to be multifactorial. And however, there is a neuroinflammation display a major role in it. And several therapies have been tried, um, you know, to combat venous spasm and uh, we don't have uh, a smoking gun uh, per se at this point that directly targets and uh, uh, prevents various so wasn't post subarachnoid hemorrhage. So exosomes are, uh, you know, 50 to 200 nanometer exosomal vesicles. The, over the last uh, five to five to six years, they've been used in uh, numerous, numerous um, um, medical uh, med medical subspecialties, uh, including uh, you know, especially in oncology and uh, spinal cord injury, where they have been shown to have a lot of properties, including. Um, including uh, uh, preventing uh, inflammatory response after neural injury. So we did a scoping review of the current uh, literature uh, where we uh, used PRISMA scoping review guidelines and uh, came up with seven studies that are selected for reviews, uh, five of which were, um, studied therapeutic roles of exosomes and two of which studied um, uh, expression profiles of in vitro exosomes uh, or um, uh, in, in, yeah, in vitro exosomes uh, after uh, induction of a subarachnoid uh, blood. Um, huh? Okay, uh, in terms of the results, we, we, so we uh, combined all the study and we identified uh, two pathways, HMGB1 and BTNF pathways, and, um, which has not been done to date. Uh, so what we realized is all this, uh, these exosomal studies um, the, uh, specifically uh, are targeting uh, anti-inflammation and neuroprotection through the microRNAs. And all of these different microRNAs, that you, as you can see in um, the first and the second figure, uh, majority target uh, either BDNF pathway or HMGB1 pathway, uh, the former of which is involved in the cell survival and neuroprotection, and the latter of which is involved in apoptosis. 
so this is uh, basically taking a step back and a big picture showing that these exosomal therapy have something, and most of these exosomes are created from the different cell lines. So they have something in common, uh, um, including different miRNAs that are targeting two specific pathways. So targeting these pathways directly may be the key in uh, um, achieving neuroprotection uh, in uh, patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage and periodic invasive spasm. Thanks very much, Abhi. Any questions from the audience? Hey, Abhi. Um, so, Abhi, so, you know, with, with exosomes, we did some work with this with brain tumors, and the ability to, to harvest them really depends on the, the fluid you're looking at. So with serum, it, it's quite hard to get a, a large amount of exosomes to analyze, and, and you kind of go to CSF. When you looked yes. at this for subarachnoid, were mo most of those studies C CSF oriented, or did they also oh. include serum? Uh, so most of the studies were uh, in terms of harvesting or treatment. Um, Har harvesting the exosomes. So harvesting the exosome, most of the study use some kind of a stem cell. So most of the, a lot of the studies use mesenchymal stem cells, which are some of the most common bone marrow, um, you know, bone marrow stem cells that uh, researchers have used for exosome uh, creation um, and um, like basically harvesting. Um, there was one study that used umbilical, human umbilical cord uh, stem cell derived exosomes. Um, but um, those are the two main um, two main locations where these exosomes come from. It's mostly bone marrow, though. But are, I guess my question is: Are they grabbing these from the the serum, the blood, or are they getting? No. Oh. So, so these are actually like bone marrow line of uh, they they basically do bone marrow aspirations. Um, I see uh, bone marrow aspirations. Uh, okay. Bone marrow aspirations. Um, and these exosomes can be stored. So, like uh, as as long as you have the bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell line, like in vitro you can just get exosomes out of them like, you know, for, for a month. As long as that cell line, you passage them and you continue to grow in those cells, you don't need to retap the bone marrow. It's, it's very, it's, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, Abby. Mm -hmm. um, Lily McCarthy, first year medical student. Hi there, my name is Lily McCarthy and I'm a first year medical student. I'll be speaking today about our recent narrative review on the application of ultra high field magnetic resonance spectroscopic imaging to high grade gliomas. High grade gliomas are the most lethal and common types of adult brain cancer. Few patients survive beyond two years after their initial diagnoses. Developing new neuroimaging techniques to visualize these high grade gliomas is crucial in order to improve outcomes and save lives. 7 Tesla Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopic Imaging, or 7TMRSI, offers a newfound window into the abnormal metabolic characteristics of high-grade gliomas, bringing us one step closer to understanding the inner workings of these elusive and devastating tumors. A form of ultra-high field spectroscopic imaging that quantifies diverse oncometabolites in the brain, 7TMRSI is more powerful and sensitive than, spectros than spectroscopy at lower field strengths and can deliver much more detailed metabolic information throughout the entire tumorigenic landscape as seen in the bottom image in the center. The metabolic maps generated from 7TMRSI provide critical new insight into specific oncometabolites that nourish high-grade gliomas, including glutamate, glutamine, glycine, as seen in the top image in the center, and 2HG, as seen in the image in the bottom left. Understanding which of these oncometabolites are present in each tumor is vital, as individual oncometabolites can actually be targeted by drugs that inhibit specific metabolic pathways and halt further growth of tumors. Fundamentally, it is the matchlessly high sensitivity of 7TMRSI, which has high spatial resolution and signal-to-noise ratio to minuscule differences in oncometabolites that accounts for its capacity to paint such high-resolution and accurate portraits of the metabolic hallmarks of high-grade gliomas. The science behind spectroscopy is pretty complex, but the essential takeaway is simple. 7TMRSI has the potential to revolutionize the way we treat high-grade glioma patients. Although further research is needed to move this technique from the experimental to the clinical realm, 7TMRSI promises to pave the way for highly personalized treatment strategies that attack specific oncometabolites and eradicate high-grade gliomas. Thanks so much, and I'll take any, any further questions. Thank you, Lily. We do have some time for questions. I have a question. So um, fantastic talk, Lily. Uh, I'm involved with 7T MRI work. And I think, you know, you raise an excellent point, which is how do you leverage the differences in the B0 state to get better resolution? Um, and uh, it seems that 
it's the spatial resolution specifically that you had employed. How did you know or what did, or what algorithm did you use to determine which part of the tumor you there are such heterogeneous tumors um, that was there an algorithm that was used? Was there uh, a, a viewer um, or reviewer intent? If you could talk about that. Absolutely, and thank you for that question. Um, so one of the sections of our narrative review concerns ways to kind of optimize spectroscopic sequences at these ultra high field um, MRI strengths. And we discuss um, kind of different different things like shimming strategies, different coils that can be used to alleviate um, some of the uh, B0 and B1 in homogeneity that is you know, particularly problematic at these ultra high field um, strengths. Great. Yeah, Raj, the other thing, you know, one of the challenges that we're trying to work through, and I think for, for your studies, I don't think this is as much of an issue, but, you know, we can't have any type of metal in the head to do these studies because of, you know, just the safety um, protocols, even though titanium is safe with MRI, there just hasn't been studies to confirm that there's no heat generation and, and other types of you know safety concerns. So that limits us really to preoperative patients uh, that haven't had craniotomies. And, and we're hoping to work through that so that we can include the patients with recurrent tumors who do have cranial fixation, because those are the patients we struggle with. I mean, at tumor board, we're always asking, well, is this due to radiation effect? Is this due to recurrence? Is it both? I mean, these are the questions that come up you know, time and time again, and it'd be nice to have some data with imaging that can really help us. Kostas and Raj, can I just comment on this? That's really interesting work. I like what you said about spatial resolution being the main thing. Uh, and the reason I, I go to this is that since the 1980s, MRS has been around as a method of looking at tissues. Uh, way back in the 80s, tissue samples were taken from brain tumors and put in a test tube and MRS was done at 12 and 15 Tesla to look at these metabolites. So what has changed since that time has been the ability to do it in a living person with voxels or regions of interest that are, I don't know what the size is, Costas, you probably know, but you know, a few millimeters as opposed to maybe a square centimeter of tissue. So really it's resolution that has changed, it seems. Yeah, and the ability to incorporate larger re regions of the brain. So with 3T MRSI, you can actually do the whole brain. You could do whole brain spectroscopic imaging and 7T, it's unclear you know, if, if we can do that yet, but we're heading that way. Cool work, thank you. Very cool. Uh, Kurt Yeager. Hey, my name is Kurt. I'm one of the PGY6 residents here, and um, I just was presenting my uh, research in looking at the systematic review of clinicaltrials.gov on clinical trials for a stroke thrombectomy. So as we know, uh, we've been doing thrombectomy for uh, acute ischemic, ischemic stroke due to large vessel occlusion for uh, several years now based on high quality clinical evidence, but as of yet, no one has really done a systematic look at the clinical trials uh, that have been published on clinicaltrials.gov. So a group of uh, medical students and residents systematically reviewed clinicaltrials.gov using the keyword thrombectomy and uh, sorting it by the disease for ischemic stroke. Uh, we looked at various variables uh, regarding these trials, including the status, whether it's ongoing or completed, the funding from either from academic or private industry or government, the type of intervention involved, whether looking at a drug or a uh, procedure or device, and then the study population in terms of age groups and, and stroke uh, types. So overall, we found results uh, from between 2004 and 2020. The first one was looking at the Mercy scent retriever device. Uh, we found 100, almost 200 uh, total trials up until October of 2020 when we did the re review, and 82% had been initiated after 2015, which was the, the publication of the, the year of publication of the landmark uh, positive trials in stroke thrombectomy. And overall, the average time to completion of these trials is about 31 months. Um, so this main graph uh, was developed from our research and it shows the increasing uh, type of interventions assessed by these clinical trials over time. 
Um, as you can see, uh, by the middle of the line is 2015, you can see a drastic explosion of these trials after the publication of the 2015 trials. The purple line represents devices, so those had an increase initially after the, uh, the early results from the, the negative clinical trials, and then um, after that, the types of different procedures involved assessing uh, uh, different stroke, stroke treatment um, increased by the, that's the yellow line there. Um, the other interventions assessed were drugs and different diagnostics. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, in conclusion, most of the publication, uh, most of the initiation of these clinical trials started after 2015, and most were in either device safety or efficacy or the assessment of a type, new type of procedure. Most were uh, funded by academic institutions or industry, and at, initially were funded by industry, and in the last couple of years, more have been uh, funded by institutions, uh, academic institutions. And those are both, uh, those are both um, uh, priests, are those are more than the governmental sources of, of funding. And then lastly, the uh, US had the most trials, about 30% of all trials came from the United States and then followed by the EU and Asia. And um, however, the EU and Asia have been increasing their uh, clinical trials over time. Now, keeping in mind, this is a US NIH um, source, but there are lots of, um, the, most of the clinical trials that are done uh, in the United States are registered here. Thanks a lot, Kurt. We have a few minutes for questions. Kurt, do you think the government should sponsor more of these, these studies? I mean, do you think it's, it's important for the government to provide funding? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, um, an interesting concept. I haven't, I hadn't really thought uh, about whether or not they should, um, but I do think it's interesting. My uh, my take is that it's interesting that industry has been decreasing relative to academic institutions funding them. Uh, I, I don't know how I feel about government uh, funding actually, but uh, I do think that um, certainly should be, but in terms of other disease states, um, I think industry does a really good job about sponsoring them because this is a, such a, it's a field that's dependent heavily on new devices and um, how the, the efficacy of the procedure does really increase with the device. I think that industry definitely has a role in funding these. The, uh, this is just a comment. The issue is, is that government can't get out of its own way. Um, they, they, they've only funded a functionally diffuse, which was funded before the sort of big transition and surge. After that, they said they were inundated with applications and said, we don't, we don't know how to decide. And so they said they want to do a platform, but they're taking three years to set up a platform. In the meantime, there's a whole nother round of industry trials moving forward. So I, I don't know, it might be something to do with just quickly evolving fields. The government doesn't know how to keep up due to bureaucracy. Very interesting. Um, next up, uh, Frank Uke. Good morning, everybody. I'm Frank. I'm the, one of the PGY-5s. So I was looking at the radiographic outcomes of expandable versus static cages and open T-lifts. Uh, this is difficult to examine uh, oftentimes because people, uh, surgeons who do open uh, T-lifts often use static cages. However, at Elmhurst, uh, we used quite a bit of uh, expandable open cages. Um, and so we wanted to look at the, um, the amount of lordotic correction and why is this important? This is important because uh, when you have a PI and LL mismatch of greater than 10 degrees in the literature, you can have up to 10 times greater rates of adjacent segment disease, PJK and revision surgery. And so we wanna make all of our efforts to increase the lordosis of, um, uh, for all of our patients and especially in open surgery. Um, however, it's difficult to achieve uh, any change in lordosis, even uh, especially during a one level or two level T lift, uh, even with panty osteotomies, where you can get max, maximum of five to 10 degrees per level. And so we looked at 28 patients uh, that we used open expandable cages, um, and 42 patients we used static cages in. And each patient underwent uh, one, two, or three level T lifts. And we did uh, very similar surges for both uh, with unilateral fastectomies to open the foramen. Um, and the most important thing is that we saw a mean segmental lordosis correction with static versus expandable. It said it's about 2.23 degrees for static and 4.12 for, for expandable. 
Um, however, that this didn't reach statistical significance. And we can likely explain this by uh, our mean uh, change in uh, mean anterior disc height. As you can see in panel A and B, this is a, a post-op and pre-op uh, patient that went into an expandable cage where we can put a much larger, uh, we can insert a smaller cage and expand it to a much larger height uh, versus a static cage on the, on the right uh, is non-expandable. So in conclusion, our, uh, we can achieve greater um, restoration of uh, anterior disc height with expandable cages, which increases the anterior fulcrum uh, of which we can compress across and, and get a better lordotic correction. Uh, we need to do serial imaging across um, uh, multiple years uh, in order to determine the rates of revision, subsidence, and, um, and this could be due to the inadequate release of facet joints or uh, violation of the end plates by the, um, by the uh, expandable cages. Thank you. Frank, I have a question for you. This seems like something that is ripe for a registry study where you just put every patient with uh, any of these implanted devices into a registry and then you can really look at their long-term outcomes and compare the different devices on the market. Have you guys considered doing that? Uh, we haven't, but, uh, but that's uh, an excellent idea. We'll def I'll bring it up with Dr. Steinberger. That would also be a great way to get numbers much higher than, um, you know, 20, what was it, 28 and 42. You know, we could get numbers in the hundreds within a few months if we, if we expand this. So that's a great, great suggestion. Not Not only that, but big study, Frank, and well done. Do you think that um, it's related, to the lack of significance is just what Jeremy's saying? That's just the power yes. of yeah, think, power? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think our power is just too low. And um, I agree with Dr. Steinberger that it would be easy to get uh, additional numbers uh, for the static patients, because uh, that's what the majority of our surgeons use in open T lifts. The difficulty will be getting higher numbers of expandable cages, because um, like I said, oh, and especially in open um, T lifts, uh, most of our surgeons use static instead of expandables. Uh, expandable, they're generally used in MIS. Uh, mm -hmm. T lifts uh, because we don't have access to the frame and as large as we do in open. So I think that that'll be our limiting factor is getting more patients with uh, uh, expandable pages and open T lifts. Nice study. Thanks. Sir. Thanks a lot, Frank, and thanks everybody. We moved through those on time actually. So nice work. Thank you very much for, for speaking briskly. We're going to have a 10 minute break prior to our main speaker, Linda Liao. Um, so please be here and with your uh, Zoom on at eight o'clock. Great job, everybody. We'll see you soon. Great job.